everybody. We are just getting started here. I'll give it a little bit of time uh, for people to log in. Appreciate you guys jumping on another Wednesday workshop from Directed IRA. We've got a special guest, which we'll get to in a minute here. Um, but hope you guys are having a good Wednesday. Hope you guys are enjoying the new content that we're bringing to you guys. Um, again, uh, I, I know a lot of you guys are probably familiar with the with the webinars and the podcasts that Matt and Mark do. Uh, these workshops are geared a little bit differently and have a little bit different of a focus um, where we're trying to fit a need. And, and that need is clients that have accounts open and funded, self-directed accounts, often have a time, hard time finding what their next investment is going to be. Uh, they realize that self-directed IRAs are more of an entrepreneurial type of an IRA where you got to go out there and actively look for your next deal, look, look for your next investment. And it can be hard sometimes when we got nine to five jobs and some of you guys aren't in the day to day or aren't full time real estate investors. So we like to bring on special guests, people that are experts in the industry. Um, they're never going to sell you investments on our program, but they are going to provide good education so that you guys as self-directed IRA account owners can better make investment decisions and better trust who you're investing with. So that's that's the key to our rethinking retirement workshops is to just kind of bridge the gap between idle accounts and investment opportunities. And we give you guys a whole wide array. So we've been focusing on real estate. Uh, we're going to we're gonna end the real estate segment with one of my favorite guests, Dallin Schultz, president of Rev, Rev Equity Group. We're going to talk about apartments. It's probably one of the fastest growing alternative assets that we see in the self-directed IRA industry. Uh, and there are some reasonings for that. And Dallin's going to go over that uh, here briefly, but uh, just enjoying you guys being on here. And again, as a reminder, if you guys have questions, type those questions into the Q&A or the chat box. I'll be monitoring monitoring that. And we've got a Q&A session at the end, but we'll try to get some questions as we go if it's pertinent to you know what me or Dallin are, are speaking to. So um, let's just jump right into it. I'm going to start off a little bit and share some slides with you guys. This is more for if anybody is new to the program. Um, I know a lot of you guys who are clients understand this stuff, but I want to just remind people who's, who Directed IRA is and what we do as a company. What are the problems that we solve for people that have retirement accounts? The main problem that we solve for people with retirement accounts is we solve a need to invest in things outside of the stock market. Most people that have a retirement account invest in the stock market, but when you ask them why, they can't tell you why. They just tell you, well, that's what I thought was my option, is to buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CDs. That's how we're taught to save for retirement. Put money in a 401k, let somebody else invest it for you, pray that the stock market goes up, and voila, that's how you retire. I think more and more people nowadays are realizing, well, that doesn't really guarantee a good retirement. I think what only guarantees a good retirement is the person that has the retirement account actively looking for what are the best investment opportunities for me and what are those opportunities going to give me in retirement. And more and more people nowadays with the information and technology that's out there are realizing that you don't have to just invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You can invest in almost anything when you have a self-directed IRA. IRS does not limit us as to what we're allowed to hold in a retirement account. The person that will limit you as to what you're allowed to hold is usually just the company you have your retirement parked at. So at Directed IRA, when you have an account with us, we don't limit you to anything. We say invest in anything the IRS allows, but you have to pick the investment. And that's where the self-directed comes in. So here's some of the common investment options that we see at uh, Directed IRA. Uh, we see rentals, flip, fix and flips, commercial property, uh, private equity, private funds, uh, syndications, promissory notes. Uh, basically, you can hold anything in an IRA except life insurance contracts and collectibles. Those are the two investments that are not allowed in an IRA no matter where you go. So if you want to invest in things outside of the public market, you just have to have an IRA with a company that will allow you to invest in those types of things. And Hello, Directed IRA. We're one of those companies, one of the few companies out there that allow you to invest in alternative assets. What types of plans can you use to invest in alternative assets? Well, the same types of plans you can use to buy stocks and bonds. Uh, these are the seven types of plans that we have just here at Directed IRA. Um, I want to focus a little bit, and I'm going to do some more classes on this because 
when I look at the numbers, I, I see a lot of our clients have maybe one account, maybe two accounts. There's seven possible accounts that you can have at Directed IRA that can be invested into alternatives. But when you look at them and you dive into them, a lot of them have different tax benefits than the others. Most people are familiar with, a, say, a traditional or Roth IRA. We've got a lot of clients that have those types of accounts. We have a lot of self-employed clients that have SEP IRAs, maybe simple IRAs, or maybe even set up a solo 401k for you and your business. Those are also accounts that you can have. And if you're self-employed, you can have an employer plan and a Roth or employer plan and a traditional. We have a lot of clients that maximize both categories of plans. But I really want to talk about the other plans too, is don't forget, you pay for health expenses with tax-free dollars. You can self-direct a health savings account with directed IRA. And the very little known account that, that some of our clients use, if you have kids under the age of 18 or grandkids under the age of 18, well, if you're going to self-direct your Roth or your traditional, why not set up a Coverdell education savings account for them and self-direct those accounts so that you could take distributions of the earnings on the investments and pay for education expenses for those kids. Things like tuition, books, room and board, computers, iPads. Specialty plans like a health savings account and education savings account, they're not retirement accounts, but they are self-directed. But you can use the money today to pay for today's expenses, not just retirement. I'll just give you my own personal example. I do notes. I do passive investing, similar to what we're talking about today. Um, I've invested into some apartments and, and some commercial deals. But on most every one of my investments, I use my Roth. I use my health savings account. And I have two nieces that I have a Coverdell education savings account set up for. Why? Because I like to get all of those buckets working at the same time. When income comes back to those accounts, they can be used for different purposes. I'm maximizing the use of tax-free buckets to pay for different things. My Roth is, is, is set up for retirement. My health savings account, I've taken money out to pay for root canals and prescriptions out of that account tax-free based on the income that I have uh, generated from my alternative investments. And then I've got some money built up in my niece's education savings account that can be used to pay for their tuition, books, room and board, and, and, and so forth. So I just want to touch on that because when we're talking about investing into things like apartments, one of the things that I often hear is that I don't have quite enough, and small is not the word, but I don't have quite enough in my IRA to, to invest in real estate. Well, this is the whole key why we have somebody like Dallin on, because Dallin Schultz and companies like Rev Equity Group, what they're allowing people to do is take different IRAs, partner them together, and participate in a larger investment, an investment that they couldn't have done, the clients couldn't have done on their own, because most people don't have enough money in their traditional or their Roth or their HSA to go buy an apartment on their own. So what do they do? They got to find somebody that has that type of investment and partner with other investors. And this is the most common investment we see at Directed IRA is clients that have taken their retirement accounts and invested and used the leverage of somebody else and leverage meaning other people's money, other people's time and other people's experience. And this is oftentimes how to get your money off of the off of the uh, sidewalk, off of this off of the side street and get it invested into something that's actually generating income and generating some profit. Um, and most of our clients have used this strategy very well. And that's why I like when we have somebody like Dallin Schultz on because Dallin is going to talk about what they do at Rev Equity to help self-directed IRA investors and non-self-directed IRA investors invest into some things that they are looking at day to day because their nine to five, even more than nine to five, is looking at apartments and other types of multifamily deals. So Dallin, are you with me? I'm with you. Dallin, uh, I'll just tell a quick story. I met Dallin at a, at a local, they had an event, which was a phenomenal event. I think you guys had well over a hundred people at that event. Robert Kiyosaki was there. We got pictures with him. It was a great event. Um, it reminded me of my days of hosting networking events. They did a phenomenal job. They're based out of Arizona, but I know that they look at projects all over the place. That's where me and Dallin met for the first time. And, um, the first thing I noticed was the just the amazing mustache, man. The, the man, the myth, the mustache, the best mustache in the business, uh, Dallin Schultz. How's it going, buddy? Thanks, Nate. I appreciate you having me on. And uh, we should probably address the mustache in the room first before we, we move forward. So one, it is real. 
<laughs> two, uh, it I, I didn't lose a bet. And three, yes, my wife is okay with it. In fact, she's the one that actually encouraged it. So that's the most important part. It, it started as a joke, but now it's kind of kind of become my thing. So um, Nate, I, I love what you're doing here. And for those listening, our company uses directed IRA personally for our investors that come into our deals. And in fact, I just had Matt Sorensen, their CEO on our podcast yesterday and just talk to him about the growth of directed IRA. And let me tell you, that dude is people centric. He is all about building quality of relationships with people so that they can improve their lives in whatever way it looks like. And he's been able to, to use directed IRA as that vehicle. So I don't know how many of you are currently working with directed IRA or, or on the fence, but I endorse them hundred percent. We we've sent several people through them and, and we'll continue to do so. So yeah, looking, definitely looking forward to, to this today. So a um, few things we're going to cover on, on this in the next 20, 30 minutes or so is first and foremost, when it comes to investing, you will find people successful in every single asset, even in, in real estate. You're going to find people that are crushing it in every single asset class. So the important thing to realize as, as, you, as you listen to this presentation and as you continue to educate yourself, find what makes sense to you. Find what resonates with you. So I'm 100% sold on apartments. I'm very passionate about it. It, it comes uh, deep from my roots, but I didn't always start there. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about my story into this and share with you why I like apartments and why they make sense to me, and then leave it up to you to determine if there's alignment there with you as well. So uh, three things that we'll touch on over the next 20, 30 minutes is why I like multifamily. And number two is very basically how these deals are structured. And number three, how to effectively and efficiently evaluate a deal. And that's probably going to be one of the most important things um, that, that we'll touch on. So before we get into that, though, as I mentioned, I didn't start in real estate. Uh, I grew up in a real estate home, but uh, my grandfather owned quite a bit of multifamily. My father managed all that multifamily, and I was the one stuck doing unclogging the toilets, uh, shingling roofs in the middle of summer, uh, waking up at three in the morning to shovel uh, snow and salt the, the sidewalks with ice. This was back in upstate New York. And that was my view of apartment investing in ownership. And I was like, this sucks. I want nothing to do with this. And so I actually took a detour and, and went into the medical field. I got my bachelor's in nursing and, uh, and very quickly realized that that's not at all what I wanted. And shortly after that, a few months into that career, I actually had a, a an injury where I broke my leg and was almost out of work and didn't know how I was going to provide for my wife, my kids. And, uh, and it was very stressful financially. And that's a whole nother story in itself. But during this time, I realized that that job, that career for me, I'm not saying it's a bad job. It, it, it was, it's not a bad career. I know a lot of people that do very, very well in it. It just didn't, it wasn't right for me. And I, I realized that it really came down to, to three things um, that, that just really at the root of it just didn't make sense and align with me as an individual. Number one is being efficient. <laughs> I don't know if there's anyone here that works in the medical field, but when you're in a hospital setting, they have systems, have processes, they try to be as efficient as they can, but it's extremely difficult. And so that efficiency, there's a lot of things that are missed, overlooked, not communicated, and it's it can just be a really big headache. Um, number two was control. I had no control of my schedule. Yes, I could request days off here and there, but other than that, there was, there's very limited control. And if I wanted to make more money, I had to see if there was additional shifts and I was uh, to work and I was very much trading time for money. And so taking control of my financial future was extremely difficult. And I remember about a year into this career, I, I went in, talked to our manager for my, my annual review. I got a 3% raise, ended up being... I think it was like a 50 or 60 cent raise. And I was like, this is, this is bullshit. This, 
this is like I've worked my ass off for an entire year. I felt like I was towards the top of, of people that they could actually rely and count on. And I got like a 50 or 60 cent raise. I was like, that's crap. So the control aspect of my financial future, it just, it wasn't there. That coupled with my injury that almost put me out of work to where I couldn't provide made me realize things had to change. And number three is the impact. Um, now working in, in the medical field, you can make an impact on the on the individuals that you serve and help. And, I, and that's what really what drew me in. But I was weighed down by all the corporate bureaucracy of, a, of the medical field. And, and it made it very difficult to feel like you were actually making a difference and an impact. So long story short, I decided that it was time for me to, to transition out and got involved in, in real estate. So I've been doing real estate for about five years now and started with some small multifamily and worked our way up. And now we're involved in, um, actually, we just crossed over $100 million worth of apartment real estate that our company is involved in. And I love talking about it. I love educating people because a lot of people don't even know that it's an option. They don't even know that they can invest into these things. And uh, I even remember driving past specifically this massive apartment community back in New York where I was growing up and, and thinking to myself, how cool would it be to own one of those one day? I had no idea how, how it would happen, but here I am today having ownership in properties just like that. And not just me, but the, the partners and the investors that we work with. So for the next few minutes, think bigger. I want to challenge you to think bigger. A lot of people, again, don't know that these types of investments are possible. And I'm here today to tell you that, that it is. And it's very possible. And we love working with people that have big visions just as we do. So with that being said, let's get into it. So I'm going to share my screen here. I just got a few slides. Um, I'm going to do a lot more talking than actually sharing a PowerPoint. That's how I prefer to present. And, uh, and by the way, we're also going to be at the Alternative Investor Summit tomorrow, me and three other members on my team. So if any of you are planning on attending, I'd love to meet you in person. I do a lot better with faces. Um, probably hard to miss me and, and my mustache. So please feel free to come up, introduce yourself. I would love to meet you in person. So let's see here. <clears throat> All right. So... Why multifamily? And again, these are reasons that made sense to me. Use your own judgment on, on this and if this type of investment vehicle aligns with your goals. So number one, why multifamily? Economies of scale. Look, there's a lot of things I can share on this slide. I'm going to share with you three that made the most sense to me early on in my career. Number one being economies of scale. What is that? So Consider, <clears throat> think of a gym membership, all right? So I don't know if anyone on this call has looked into buying their own set of weights, but just an example to help paint this picture of economies of scale. If you wanted to buy your own set of dumbbells during COVID when gyms shut down and people started buying their own weights and machines, perfect example, okay? Let's say you just wanted to buy your own set of dumbbells. So if you're going to get a set, we'll say from five pounds all the way up to 50 pounds, the average cost of just the dumbbells alone for a set like that, you're looking at probably right around $400 just, just for the dumbbells, okay? Now you consider that there's entire gym memberships that you can purchase for $10 a month. That's if you're paying $10 a month, that's over three years of time that you can spend going to the gym with the same amount of money that you would have invested in just dumbbells. That's economies of scales. Why can gyms do that? Because they bring so many more people in at a smaller fraction that invest in this larger, essentially investing in this larger facility through your membership and it opens up all these opportunities for you to use not only the dumbbells, but all the other machines that they have there. And typically classes are included as well. So that's one example of economies of scale. <clears throat> Another example, my wife and I, we absolutely love cruises. 
you go on a cruise ship, you're looking on average, probably around a hundred dollars a day per person. Now that includes the room, the food, the activities, full service. They turn your towels into animals and set it on your bed. They, they, they clean your bedroom, they clean your bathroom, nice sit down meals, all you can eat ice cream, all of that for a hundred dollars a day. How? Because of economies of scale. When you bring a few thousand people onto a ship like that and it's running nonstop, you're able to experience uh, more benefits for a fraction of the price. That is economies of scale. It becomes a lot more efficient to operate these types of, of businesses. It is absolutely no different for multifamily or apartments. And a lot of people start by, by wanting to get into a single family home which isn't a bad investment. I think it's a good investment because it's still real estate. But if you're going to throw 50,000, 100,000 into a single family home, if that tenant moves out, now you're 100% vacant. If the air conditioning, the HVAC system goes out, that's four or $5,000 minimum to repair. Kiss your cash flow goodbye. So it's very difficult to tap into these economies of scale with single family homes we're buying ownership into a fund or a syndication that's buying, let's say, a 100-unit property. Now, 10 people move out, you're still 90% occupied. It's a lot more efficient to operate these businesses. That economy is a scale. Something just clicked in my brain. It made sense to me. Second one, forced appreciation. This is, I think, really what hit it home for me and why I decided to go all in with multifamily. And to really cover this, we've got to break it down into, uh, into another slide. So I'm going to ask you, if you have your phones, you're welcome to do the math along with me. I think that's important to understand. Very simple, basic math. I'm not asking to do any, any calculus or, or any trigonometry or anything like that, okay? Forced appreciation. There are that when you look at valuing an apartment building, you are buying a business. Businesses are valued based on how much income they generate. So the, the simple formula to determine this for apartments, you take your net operating income. Okay, your net operating income, you have your income minus your expenses gives you your NOI or net operating income. It does not include your debt service or your loan payments. So keep that in mind. So the value, you take your NOI, you divide it by your cap rate. That's what the market determines. The, the market determines that. You don't have much control of the cap rate. I'm not going to get into cap rate on this call, but definitely something that if you're unfamiliar with it, look it up. There's some YouTube videos. You can Google it. But this is the formula. You take your NOI divided by the cap rate. Cap rate, like I said, we don't have control of. Even as operators, we don't have control. The market determines what that is. However, the net operating income, remember that's your income minus your expenses, we do have control of that. And this is where you can really force the appreciation. So let me walk you through an example here quickly. And Nate, if there's any questions that come up in the meantime, I'm not paying attention, please Stop me, interrupt me, let me know. Yes, I, I will. And so anybody that has questions, just type them in. Um, but uh, I want I want to let Dallin continue because this is my favorite part about apartments. When I started going to events and learning about how apartments are very different than, than residential, one of the things that triggered me on apartments was the forced appreciation. And it, in forced appreciation, I'll let Dallin speak to this. It's not just you know rehabbing the renters and getting rent. It's not just that. It's th It's simple things like, painting reserve parking spots and adding that to people's leases, changing out the toilets, you know, things that, you know, replacing the management company. These are all things that savvy and experienced apartment investors do to dramatically increase the value of the property without waiting for appreciation like most people have to do when they buy a rental property. Exactly. So let's say you bought a property um, and it, the net operating income was $1.6 million a year. Divided by a 5% cap rate, you're looking at a $32 million number. Now, we're, we're talking big numbers here because these are multi-million dollar projects and properties that we get involved in, okay? So 
the 1.6 million divided by 5%, right? If you just do that on your phone, 1.6 million divided by 0 0.05, it gives you that 32 million. So to kind of give you an idea of what to expect, that's around uh, at 165,000 per unit, you're right around 190 unit property. So it's definitely not uncommon and very, very common for people to get involved in deals like this. In fact, we just, uh, just the other day, wired um, seven figures over to one of our partners for a 382 unit project. So anyway, so you got your, your valuation here. Um, so you're looking at $32 million, okay? That 1.6 is your net operating income. Again, it's your income minus your expenses. So to drive that NOI, what you wanna do is try to boost your income and decrease your expenses. And Nate touched on this. It's more than just raising rent. Like, yes, we go in, a big part of the business plan is we go in, we renovate these units, and we, because we do that, we're able to bring rents up quite significantly, which then increases the income for the property. But there's other ways to do this. A lot of these larger properties will have storage units on there, so you can rent out the storage. It might have covered parking. You can rent out covered parking. A lot of projects are putting in smart home features or package lockers. Like a lot of people don't think of this. A lot of us probably live in homes where when you order something off Amazon, it gets delivered right at your front door, not in apartment buildings. So one of the things that uh, some of our partners are doing is they're putting storage lockers in around the pool, around the amenity center. So when people order packages from Amazon, UPS, FedEx, they can drop it in that storage locker right on site. So they don't have to go to the store to pick it up. So you can work things in like that, the smart thermostats, smart locks, and then charge a small amenity fee for things like that. So there's ways to boost income and decrease expenses. And they touched on toilets. There's ways where you can significantly decrease the water consumption just by putting in low flow toilets, faucets, other things like that to bring down the expenses of that property, okay? So the second example, okay, 1.6 million, let's say we increased the NOI by $400,000. Now that might sound like a big number, but listen, when you spread that out over 190 units, that's only $175 increase per month per unit, over 190 units. And that, that $175, I'd say that's below average what people are even typically seeing just in rent bumps when you get into these types of projects. That doesn't include everything else that's going into it. So even though it's a $400,000 increase, very reasonable with the numbers that we're presenting. Let's assume the market doesn't change just to understand this concept. So now you take your $2 million and you divide it by 5%. So if you have your phone and you want to walk through this with me, go ahead and do it. You take 2 million divided by 0 0.05. You're now looking <clears throat> at a project that's going to be roughly worth $40 million. You increase the NOI $400,000. That's it. But because of the way these projects are, are valued, because of that $400,000 increase in the NOI, you just boosted the value of that property by $8 million. That $8 million is what we share with our investors. That, and, and on top of that, there's money that flows to the investors because these properties are cash flowing. They're putting out money while we're doing these renovations, while we're implementing this business plan. So on average, you'll see projects like this go for three to five, three to five years, roughly is about what it takes to go through them. This is forced appreciation. You hey, have, can I, yes. Can I, can I add, I, I want to add something to that too, for, for all you smarty pants, uh, investor, self-direct IRA investors that always like to ask me about UBIT. This is an important factor because, you know, for people that are concerned with, well, you know, if my IRA is invested in something that has some debt on it, which most people buying apartments are not just using cash, whether it's self-directed IRA cash or not, they're getting a loan from a bank to help 
you know, renovate these properties and, and acquire them. But when you're thinking about your your UBIT, it's always based on the percent that the of debt that's on the property. When you have a strategy that increases the value of that property by eight million dollars, your percentage of debt just got slashed. So by the time that a lot of these uh, investment sponsors sell these properties, they've already pushed the value of the property, but they haven't put on more debt. Um, so in a lot of these cases, the the debt that you started with or the debt leverage percent you start with is not even close to what you end with, which plays good in the fact where people are concerned about this unrelated debt finance income tax. We'll touch on it later, but I just want to make sure that self-directed IRA clients know that that's an important figure, especially when you're worried about that tax everyone likes to talk about. Yeah, excellent. Great point. Thanks, Nate. This was the second point that just hit at home for me, and I want to spend a little bit more time on it just to really, uh, for those that are, are unfamiliar with this process, to really understand how apartments work. It's a commercial real estate asset class, and it's it's a business. It's a business that you're buying and participating in. Number three, that just made sense to me. You are providing a basic human need. There's a psychologist, old, older psychologist um, known as uh, Maslow, and he created this, this pyramid called this uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some people are probably familiar with it. So his whole theory and idea is that this, this pyramid that he presented, that there's different levels and that people had to feel comfortable or have some of the items experienced in one level before they can get to the next level. And I should have provided an, an image here and I, and I failed to do so. But at that basic level, you got, it's basically survival, food, water, shelter. We are providing a basic human need for these people. And some of us have probably rented places where we had slumlords running them. And, and we, we fell into this mindset of this is how all operators, apartment operators are. And I'm here to tell you that is 100% not the case. Good operators care very much for their tenants. And we'll put on events for them for 4th of July. We'll do back to school events where we fill up backpacks with school supplies that they'll give to the kids. They'll put on different barbecues and dinners. And uh, back when COVID happened and a lot of people couldn't pay rent, there's a lot of rental assistance, but people didn't know where to start. So a lot of operators and property managers went to those tenants and said, hey, let me help you apply to get that rental credit. It benefits us as operators too. I mean, our, our tenants really are our, our customers. You want to take good care of them and you 100% can take care of them as long as you have a good team that's overseeing it. So again, these are just three items that I touched on, but here's the kicker, okay? I told you why I fell out of the medical field, why it makes sense to me, efficiency, control, and the impact. This wasn't until years later that I realized what I was looking for, I had found here in apartments. Again, for me, I'm not saying this is the same for you. Economies of scale, that's all about efficiency. That's all about driving efficient to get more for less without cutting corners. That's really what it's about, right? Forced appreciation, that is control. We can take control of that value. And the way we're compensated as operators and our investors, it's all about driving that force appreciation. We're incentivized to perform well. We have control not only of that asset, which anyone that's invested in the stock market, good luck trying to control that. Good luck trying to control your return. We can do that with apartments. And it gets passed down to us and, and our partners that that uh, work with us. Number three, basic human need, you 100% can make an impact with apartments. You are creating, when you're buying 200, 300 units, you're not buying a house, you're buying a community. And you and your management team can really set the culture at that property. You can keep it clean. You can have good lighting around so people feel safe. You can add hammocks. You can add and improve the amenity centers. You can make an impact on these communities to improve the quality of lives for those people that are living there. Some might be there by choice. Some might be because that's all that they can afford. But regardless of the fact, you can improve their overall experience because of that. This is a big reason why I like multifamily. 
no, that's uh, that's all I had for the PowerPoint. But there was two other things I wanted to touch on: how these deals are structured, very briefly, and then how to effectively and efficiently evaluate a deal. But before we move on to those topics, was there anything related to what we just talked about? That uh, Nate, are there any questions related to anything we just talked about? Yes. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, Claire asked the question, um, do you have to be an accredited investor to invest with REF? Excellent. Uh, question is, it depends. And we will, I'll get to that. I can get to that in a minute. Um, it depends on what offering we have at that time. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. Okay. And then she's got another question. Some of them are IRA related. So I'll, I'll answer these at, you know, okay. at the end. Um, and let's see, Claire has another question. My other question is if you don't go through an IRA and you still invest, do you still get past the tax write-offs related to real estate? So this is non-IRA stuff. Do your clients get tax benefits? Okay. I Disclaimer, right? We always have to leave with disclaimers. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a tax advisor. I'm not a tax planner. But what I have seen and what I have personally experienced is yes, you still experience the tax benefits. Um, and uh, and again, this next, how these deals are structured will help uh, explain that a little bit more. Awesome. She says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, well, let's move on to the next uh, topic that I wanted to touch on very briefly on how these deals are structured. We use limited liability companies. We use LLCs to purchase these properties. So when you when you go to buy a property, there's there's a company that owns it. Investors come in and they they buy ownership. They buy ownership or shares, if you will, in that company. So when people partner with us, they literally become partners. There, there's an operating agreement. They're listed on that operating agreement. It shows how much percentage of the company they own. This is a private equity fund. This is a private equity opportunity. So it's not a debt opportunity. It's, it's equity. You are buying equity. You're buying ownership in that company. So because you're doing that, and Claire, this will go back to your question, because you're buying ownership in that business, any of the profit and loss that comes through the company from the apartments, you get to realize, you get to experience because you are an equity owner in that LLC. Now, there's this magic word out there, uh, maybe not so magic. I, I love it. It's called depreciation. It's one of the most... Uh, powerful ways to reduce your tax liability through real estate and it's through depreciation and, and basically what depreciation is is it's a it's a loss a paper loss that the IRS will give you when you buy a property because they're saying hey a lot of these components that building it's going to wear out over time we'll give you a little bit of a loss that you can take to offset some of the, the expenses that are gonna come out because of it. So that depreciation is what us and our partners get to realize and it can significantly offset some of those potential gains. But again, you wanna make sure you have a good real estate CPA and accountant. And when I say good real estate CPA or accountant, quick example, very first accountant I had a few years ago, it was about five years ago, we started asking about the depreciation and the tax benefits. And uh, and this is, listen, this accountant, I, I'm not trying to knock your $500 accountants that do your taxes and just plug and chug. But if you're getting involved in real estate, get yourself a good CPA that costs more than five, 600 bucks to do your taxes. And his response to us was, Dallin, taxes is just part of doing business. So just get comfortable paying it. I see where he's coming from, but immediately I knew he was unfamiliar with real estate because I knew people, I knew people that were investing in apartments and real estate that were paying zero dollars in taxes for multiple years in a row. So we got a new CPA and it cost a lot more money, but he saved us a lot more money. And, and what I mean by that is I personally haven't paid taxes in the last three years. In fact, this year will be the first year that I'm paying taxes and it's because I wasn't planning enough last year. So that's 100% on me. It had nothing to do with the real estate. 
So it can be a very powerful tax vehicle um, uh, to, to reduce your tax liability as long as it's structured properly. And because you are an equity owner in that company that's buying the property, then you get to experience those as well. So, and, and the important thing to realize is, uh, as I mentioned, some of these deals, you're looking at 20, 30, $40 million. Most people don't have that sitting in their back pocket. So yes, we typically use bank financing to leverage anywhere from 60 to 70% of that amount. And then the rest of it comes from people like us. It comes from the equity investors that come into that deal. And so people can come in, some groups offer minimums as low as 25,000. And you'll see a lot probably around the 50,000. Now our minimum with REV for current opportunities is 100,000. And occasionally we will reduce that. Occasionally we will reduce that to about 50,000. So there are opportunities for you to be a part of a $32 million property without having millions of dollars. And some of our best investors are self-directed IRA investors that had that had money sent from an old uh, retirement account or an old employer just sitting rotten away in the stock market. And so they transitioned it over to a self-directed IRA and they've been able to participate in some of our deals. Um, and, and to go back to Claire's question too, uh, do you have to be accredited to participate in our deals? I said, it depends. Our current offering, yes. But the two previous offerings we had before, you didn't have to be accredited for that. So it just really depends on what the offering is and how it's structured um, to, to, to be able to participate or not. And, uh, and, and you'll see, you'll see different, different ways are offered with multiple operators. Before we get too far, Dallin, I, I want to address, there's been a couple questions about uh, UBIT. Um, and this is a great question. Um, if, if you can unshare your screen, oh, you already did. Let me share one slide with you guys here. We did, we went over this last week, but I want to explain what this UBIT is for people that don't understand what it is. Um, this is only a tax that deals with mostly IRAs, but it, it's actually, it, it broadens out. It's really for tax exempt entities. Uh, tax exempt entities can be a church. That's a tax exempt entity, but the most common one that we have are IRAs. They're tax exempt. So most of the time when you're buying and selling investments, especially when it comes to real estate, if that investment is all cash from your IRA and there's no debt, all of the income comes back to your IRA completely free of tax. So you're, you can reinvest all of that capital and your IRA is not a tax payer because again, it's a tax exempt entity. Things change though, when you run into two circumstances, mainly are the most common scenarios where you'll hear people mention UBIT. One is if your IRA owns a business. Now, this is more like an operating business, a trade or a business that has ordinary income. For instance, your IRA buys a pizza shop. This is a real life example. I had a client that wanted to buy a pizza shop in his IRA. Well, usually IRAs directly owning businesses that are in competition with other businesses doesn't really make sense because you just make your IRA a taxpayer at that point. Okay, so we're not really talking about that type of investment right now, but we are talking about real estate that might have some debt on the property. Okay, now this goes with whether you have debt on a single family property or you have debt on an apartment building. And how this tax works is the IRS says, well, if your IRA didn't make 100% of the investment and you had some outside funds, let's say from a bank, um, we're going to let you keep all of the profit from the IRA's portion completely tax exempt, but that money that you borrowed, we're going to have we're going to have you pay a little bit of tax on that piece. So this is called unrelated debt financed income tax, and this is the one you see more common with buying apartments or even buying debt leveraged you know real estate. Here's the kicker, though. The tax only is based on the percent of debt leverage. So let's just give a, an example that you've got $10,000 of income to your IRA on a debt leverage property, okay? And that debt is 50% of the property, okay? You're not going to get taxed on the $10,000 of income. You're only going to get taxed potentially on a portion of the $5,000 of income, okay? Now, that's our starting point. Here's the deal. When you IRA becomes a taxpayer, guess what you get to use now? You get to use depreciation and expenses to offset that tax. So you're only going to be paying tax at the very end on the net 
profit. So now this is a circumstance where your IRA can use depreciation because now there's a tax to depreciate against. So I'll just, I'm just making up numbers here. Again, I'm not a CPA either. Let's say that that $5,000 of taxable income goes down to four, okay? Here's the other thing that kicks in. Most of these multifamily properties are not flips. Most of these multifamily properties are longer holds, longer than a year and a day. So guess what? Now, what else does the IRA get to use? Doesn't have to pay taxes as a taxpayer, which is a trust. It gets to use long-term capital gains tax, which at the max is 20%. So now we're down to 20% of $4,000. Great. I'll nerd out even a little bit more on UBIT and UDFI. Based on the UDFI rules, you don't have to pay tax on the first $1,000 of income. And that's yearly. So now we're down from $4,000 to $3,000. And even if we had to pay a maximum of 20% long-term capital gains on that, on that $10,000 or now $4,000 of income, $3,000 of income, now we're looking at what? $600 in taxes on $10,000 of income. So every time that I've seen people actually go through an investment that might be taxed, by the time that their CPA throws depreciation, long-term capital gains, the fact that you don't have to pay taxes on the first thousand dollars of income, the tax is so small. It's like, well, I did a lot better on that investment than I would have done in the stock market. So UBIT and UDFI is not something to immediately scare you out of the investment. You want to just see, okay, what is my net income going to be potentially? What, how much of that do I have to pay in taxes? And how does that equate to my alternative? Could I make more or less in the stock market? What are my other areas of opportunity? Um, oftentimes I've seen just the use of debt does not mean it's, it's a bad investment. It actually means it's a better investment, especially when you talk about economies of scale. And I would always just encourage people to you know, get with a CPA that understands real estate. For, start there. Don't use a CPA that is not a real estate investor because they're not going to be able to understand, you know, all, some of this stuff, especially when it comes to UBIT or UDFI. I always say it's not something to be scared of, just something to be aware of. And even if you are uh, it, paying a little bit of tax, A, doesn't make it a bad deal, but there's ways around it too. If you're self-employed and you have a solo 401k, you don't even have to pay UDFI. So that's obviously for just self-employed individuals, but there are ways to minimize it and get around it. But I like the question. Um, I would just say, just look at it, ask, ask your CPA, look at the numbers. And oftentimes you're not even worried about that income. And a lot of times too, and I'll, Dallin, I'll let you address this. You're only going to pay tax on the income the IRA is receiving. Sometimes you don't receive income right away because the project's in development, the project's redeveloping, they're forcing appreciation. So you might get some small uh, payments as cash flow comes in, but you're not getting huge chunks of payments right away where you're worried about paying any tax on it. Yeah, with, with these types of deals, as I showed in that example, we boosted the value by $8 million. Our investors don't realize that until we sell, or until right. we refi. So when, from what I've experienced, when this UBIT or UDFI typically kicks in, it's on the sale of a property. Now, there's some operators, we haven't done this yet, but it's definitely something we'll consider if it's right, you can just 1031 into the next opportunity. You yep. can just 1031 and keep rolling it over and keep deferring that tax. So now, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to open up a can of worms by any means, but I have a CPA that says, hey, if I were you, I would just take it out of your IRA, pay the tax now, and then invest into real estate because of the tax benefits that come through. So Every situation, everyone's situation is going to be a little bit different. And this is why you need a good custodian like directed IRA that knows the vehicle of the self-directed IRA and a good CPA. And then oh, obviously here's a good question. And obviously a good operator that's actually making you money and not losing you money. <laughs> yeah. Got a couple of good questions for you, but I'll address this one from Ron. Ron, thanks for the question. He said, what type of IRA do you recommend uh, to use for investments for retired folks, Roth or traditional? I'm a big fan of the Roth. I've got a class coming up that we're going to well announce here in the next couple of weeks that talk about Roth conversions. I think Roth conversions is something anybody at any age should look at. I, it doesn't matter if you're 90 years old. I've had clients do Roth conversions in their 90s because it made a whole lot of sense to pay the taxes on their traditional IRAs before they invested into something positive that was actually profiting in a Roth IRA. It also stops your RMDs. 
when you're looking at investments that might be taxed, again, I, I don't like to spend a whole lot of time on this UBIT stuff because it, it's not even that big of a deal. But if it is a big deal to you, well, then use use an account that's not taxed on distributions. So if you're if you have to pay a little bit of tax on the investment, well, don't use a traditional IRA for the for investments that are going to trigger UBIT. Use your Roth IRA, use your HSA, use your ESA, use your Roth 401k, because at least you know those accounts grow where you, when you take distributions at the right time, you're not taxed on the distributions. So uh, oftentimes when you look at it that way, you, you see that there's still wealth building opportunities, even if you got to pay a little bit of tax along the way, just pick the right account to do it. Um, I've got some questions for uh, that I'll address to you, Dallin. Uh, it says, sure. have you had a project not go as planned? I love this question. Have you had a project not go as planned and how did you overcome the challenges? Yeah, so two, actually. Number one was when I very first got into real estate, I did one house flip and I'll never do a house flip again. And uh, I was just, I was inexperienced. My partner was a contractor and uh, and it made sense. And we we bit off more than we could chew. It wasn't a simple lipstick fix. Uh, we we blew out the back wall, added a 600 square foot addition, and it, it was it was a mess. So that one we we didn't lose money. I I take that back. We lost money. The one investor we brought in on it, we made sure he received everything, and me and my partner took the loss on that. So he he got everything that he put in. Didn't work out his plan. Vowed I'd never do a house flip again. That was five years ago or so. Yeah. Um, and then th these are great questions, by the way. And it's important that you ask these two operators and people that you're you're looking to partner with. So I, yeah, I would say if you're ever dealing with a, a, an investor that says they've never run into a problem, run steer clear of that investor because yeah. they haven't been investing long enough. Uh, most every investor will tell you they've stubbed their toe here or there because there's just some things that you just can't plan for. Um, yeah. But I think it's important, like Dallin mentioned, what do you do when the un for when the unplanned happens, and I think you just made a great example of that. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, no, no, you're you're exactly right. And the other one was a development project that we're about three months out from finishing. This is a RV and self storage development. This isn't our primary niche, if you will. We focus on value add apartments that are actively cash flowing because they're, those are the most uh, risk mitigated, in my opinion. So this this development project was a new opportunity. We don't have a ton of experience. We brought experience on and we ran into some snags in the approval process, which delayed our project six months. So with that, we didn't have a ton of investors. That was a smaller group of us that came together. Um, so that one, we we it's still going to work out great, but the project's delayed for six months and it's going to require a little bit more money. So in that situation, we just explained, hey, this is how we got into the situation based on the knowledge and information we had up to this point. This is what we have now. This is what we're doing to, to mediate it, remediate it and, and move forward. And what we found is most people get it. Like stuff happens, stuff happens. And, and that actually, it's a good segue into the last point I wanted to touch on. And we, we want to give Matt a few minutes too, correct? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I'll take 30 seconds. Most people, one of the biggest mistakes people make when they invest into apartments or any type of investment, alternative investment, is they start with the deal. They start with the deal itself. And I'm telling you, that is the worst mistake you can possibly make. The process that we go through when we vet people we partner with and the way we educate our partners and investors to do as well is number one, start with the operator. Vet that operator. And I'm going to throw in this chat box here, Nate. I don't know if the guests will get it. Yeah, as long as you type to everybody, they'll get it. I don't know if I have that option. It just has you, Austin, okay. and Matt. Okay. What What are you trying to type? Are you trying to type your email? I, I put it in the chat box. It's a It's a link to our website and a, a okay. resource. Okay. So, well, I've got a slide that it's got your website on it um, okay. coming up. So it's just, it's investwithrev.com if you guys okay. are interested. I've so also we got- have like we, we have a three or four page PDF on there of questions you should be asking operators. So every group that we partner up with, we go through that. We write up a whole report. Those are questions you should be asking too. It's a PDF. You can access it. Investwithrev.com slash resources. You can download it for free there. So and there's start, another place I was, I was going to say, sorry, you, there's another place you guys can go is we just had this segment last week. So if you were on the program last week, Tom Berry did a good job of just talking about what 
types of due diligence and types of questions you should ask. And I've already seen uh, Dallin's, they basically marry each other. So go to go to invest with Rev and check out that PDF. But you can also go back to last week's workshop, which is on our YouTube channel, where we have we do a whole course on due diligence. Yep. So start with the operator, then you look at the market that you're investing in, and then you look at the deal. And if I had personally, if I had to weight those based on a percentage, I'd probably attach 70% to that operator. 20% to the market and 10% to the deal because you can have a very super quality deal with crappy operators and they're going to drive it into the ground. On the flip side, you can have an okay deal with a good operations team and it's going to be a home run. And so when you're vetting the operator and you know the market that you're getting involved in, I personally would say that that's 90% of your due diligence. Yeah, that's what Tom, Tom said. He vets the person first. If he can't get past the person, he doesn't invest in the yep. deal. It doesn't matter how good the deal is. Yep. Yep. Exactly what you said. 100%. Yep. Um, yep. I got a question from Ryan. And then what I want to do is I want to bring in somebody else from our staff here that actually handles uh, our clients who want to invest in um, in apartments or, or syndications or other types of, we call them institutional investments. But first, uh, Ryan has a question. If I have a self-directed IRA with directed, it only has 50K in it. How do I find these $32 million properties that I can invest in? Also, what's Dallin's company name? So Dallin's company name is Rev Equity Group. We actually, me and Dallin actually talked about this uh, offline before we started is, and this is why it's important if you guys go back and watch the program when I talk about the different types of accounts you can use. Um, I know that Dallin's company per se, if you've got you know, uh, an account, you've got some money in your Roth IRA, maybe your spouse has a Roth or a traditional IRA, you've got an HSA, you know, that's a way to increase your investment capital by using multiple self-directed accounts, not just one. And, in, and invest with an operator that will allow you to use multiple accounts and still count it as one investment, which I know for on some of, of Dallin's projects, they do. And they've actually done that for some directed IRA clients. So just get outside of the box of thinking about, I've only got this much in this account. Think about what other accounts can I establish with directed IRA that gets me to the point where I can make an investment. You want to touch on that, Dallin? Add anything to that? Uh, no, I, I I think you hit it good. Like we'll, okay. we'll treat investors like we we had an investor come in. He had 200 in one account and 150 in another. And so he came in for collectively of 350K and that put him in the top tier of our current investment opportunity. So he was able to combine that. Awesome. I want to bring on real quick. I want to introduce you guys to somebody, Matt Duffy. Uh, Matt, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. There you are. Uh, you guys on the line have probably worked with Matt. If you've got a self-directed IRA with a directed IRA and you've invested into some previous deals, whether they're Dallin's or somebody else's, you might have worked with Matt Duffy. And I wanted to bring Matt Duffy first to introduce him. I'll just tell you a little ba background on him and his team, the business development team. They fund, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand investments like this uh, in, in their time, maybe even more, but they are very, very busy and they do this day to day. So I just wanted to bring him on to just really briefly talk about what are the steps, like how does somebody take a directed IRA and invest into syndications or apartments? So Matt, thanks for uh, spending a little time with us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on and uh, thanks for coming on, Dallin. You know, always love hearing you talk, but um, yeah, basically, you know, getting started, you know, we work. Our business development team, we work with a lot. You know, we work with the Rev Equity Group, with Dow and his investors. So, yeah, we see, you know, all types of investments coming through, you know, subscription into it, buying into the syndication, as you know, an LP, you know, even just private lending. So we see it all. We know, you know, how to get you through from, you know, step one to step three. And I'll try to touch on that now where, um, you know, step one, we establish the account like they were just mentioning there. You know, we have several different account types. You know, you have your IRAs, Roth IRAs, HSAs, covered L accounts and solo 401ks. So all of our account applications, you know, are online, all pretty simple to get started. It takes about five minutes to go through. And so um, if you're not sure exactly what you want, need to, you know, some help finding it out. That's where our team comes in. You know, we can schedule calls with you, you know, anytime during the week to kind of, you know, help you through that discovery, figure out what account type, you know, is right for you, what we can get opened up. And that kind of leads us into the next part, you know, the funding of an account. And so uh, depending on what type of funds you have, that kind of dictates where we're going to go with the account. So uh, from there, we'll help you either, you know, do a transfer or do a rollover from your account. You know, most common ones, if you have an old 401k or something like that, great way to fund your account from a company you left a while ago. 
Um, but yeah, if you have an account with somewhere like Fidelity or Schwab, we can get that transfer, you know, process in, you know, just a couple business days. They're pretty quick. Um, you know, everything we take care of on our side that we can get out, we push through quickly. Sometimes if you're working with like Wells Fargo or Pershing, you know, unfortunately those are out of our control, but typically we can get someone funded with inside of, you know, three to five business days. Um, and then once we have that account, you know, opened, so we have your IRA open, we get your funds from Fidelity, we hop into that third step, invest the account. Um, and that's where we work with you and your investment sponsor, you know, someone like Dowell and Rev or, you know, another syndicator you're working with. We'll work together with you to make sure we have your proper documents. So for something like a uh, PPM or you're doing a subscription, we'll get the subscription documents, you know, the underlying, you know, LLC operating agreement, all that good stuff, the EIN. Um, and then the most important piece is we have a direction of investment form. So depending on what you're doing, we have a form that you'll fill out. What that does, you're authorizing us to go ahead and sign off on it. Uh, basically, if you think about your self-directed IRA, um, you're the captain of your ship, and then we're just, you know, the crew members on it. So we assist you, but you're the one pointing us in that direction to get your investment funded. Um, and nice thing about it, our investments team, they're great. They're on top of it. They like to push out deals. They don't like to sit on that. Uh, paperwork. So once we have everything in good order with them, you know, typically inside of 24 to 48 hours, we'll turn around your investment as long as all those documents are good and signed, and we'll send out your funds. So probably a common timeline for people getting up, funded, and invested. It's about two weeks, I'd say, would be the average for most investors. You know, sometimes a little bit quicker, maybe a little bit longer, but you know, we can pretty much you know kind of churn and burn once we get through it. And if we're working, you know, with several deals with the same uh, group, you know, that process just gets more refined. We start kicking those out even faster. And one thing I want to just touch on, Matt kind of touched on it too, is usually the longest part of the whole process is just moving money from your existing IRA or old 401k to us. And that's the only thing out of our control. So you can open an account with us and we can have it open within that same day. I opened, I moved my accounts here and literally I got a notification in like two hours that my account was open. It was phenomenally fast. Once we get the account funded, though, we're also extremely fast. That's where Matt and Jeff and the guys on the biz dev team will basically handhold you to get you to funding that investment. But here's where you want to just make sure that you get the funding started ahead of time. I've seen, I've been in this business for 10 years. I've seen clients all the time miss out on investments because we're still waiting on the money to get moved from like a Wells Fargo advisors, a Vanguard, a piercing. There's some companies that work very fast. I would say your, your Fidelities and Charles Schwab's work very fast. They, they do so many transfers and rollovers that it's just like no, no thing to them. We send a fax to them based on what the client wants to move over. They send a wire, it usually takes three to five business days. But if you work with some other, maybe a small uh, advisor, or you've got some small shop that you've got your money parked with, they, I, I will say this, they will sometimes purposely delay it because they don't want to see your money leave their institution. So the one thing that I would say is if you really, really want to get in an investment, whether it's revs or somebody else's, make sure you get that funding aspect started early because we're not, we send the request, but after that it's, we're hands off. We just got to wait for that company to send those funds. So uh, thanks Matt for, for doing that. And if you guys ever have any questions, if you're an existing directed IRA client, reach out to Matt directly if you've got, you know, an investment that you want to get processed. So um, hopefully you guys can see the emails here if you guys need anything. Um, I do want to re uh, remind everybody too, we do have a YouTube channel that we're adding more content to. If you scan that QR code th there, it'll take you directly to it. I suggest you guys subscribe to it, um, get the notifications on there. We're, always, we're going to be doing these probably increasing. We'll probably increase these to once a week. Uh, we've just had so many people reach out to us and they just want more content and we've got tons of content. So uh, we're going to get it out there for you guys uh, and also go to our website. We've got a ton of uh, articles. Uh, obviously, Matt and Mark do a great job. There's stuff on there that dives into UBIT and UDFI. I think we addressed it a lot here on the program. Again, not something to be worried about, just something that you want to factor into your investment opportunities. And if you guys are watching this program and you have not opened accounts or maybe you have a traditional Roth, but you realize I need to get my HSA over to directed IRA. I need to set up some Coverdells uh, for my kids and start paying for their education expenses with tax-free dollars. Uh, use that coupon code there when you guys open an account. Uh, this is a, an ever-ending uh, coupon code you can use, RYR100, which gives you $100 off 
each account you open for the first year. So you get $100 basically credit towards your administration fee for as many accounts as you want to open. So you open five accounts, you get a $500 credit basically amongst all those accounts. So it's a good way to get involved. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, sometimes you need more accounts to invest into some bigger projects. But again, it's a good way to get more tax exempt accounts working for you guys. Um, and I hope that you guys enjoyed uh, the program today. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, Dallin, any last words as we, as we kind of sign off here? No, again, like it's, it's hard with how much I, I enjoy talking about apartments and multifamily and, and just educating people on it. It's hard to condense it into, but I told you guys, this is going to be, I, I told you now I had, I had about 20 minutes, ended up going like 40, 45 minutes. I just, okay. I, I get it's passionate stuff, about it. Yeah. So listen, we we're very big on education. We have a lot of free resources out there on our website. So I know Nate provided it earlier. If you go to investwithrev.com, you can gather some more information there. And listen, I'm always open to jumping on on a 15 minute intro call. And in fact, there's a you can schedule that on the website. There's a link. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my number right now. So feel free to, to shoot me a text and we can figure out a time to connect if this is something that's aligned with your investment goals. And it goes, this is my cell. It's my cell number I'm giving you. It's not going to my assistant in the Philippines, right? It's my number. 480-486-9324. And I just added that to the uh, chat box for anybody that's interested. And that is a good segue. We did have some questions on there. I did not... Uh, uh, glance over them. I saw them. If you've got investments specific or questions specific to, you know, what Dallin's investments pay out and stuff, we don't do that on the program, but you're more than willing to call him or shoot him an email with the information that we provided and have that discussion offline. So uh, this is merely educational and Dallin, thanks, man. We really appreciate it. Great, great workshop. Thanks, Matt, for joining in and talking about the process. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. This has been another rethinking your retirement workshop and we're off to Costa Mesa for the alt asset summit so anybody that's going out there uh, excited to see you guys we do have some more events coming down the line if you guys couldn't make this one and we'll start uh, announcing that to you guys as we go but uh, for for that have a good Wednesday everybody we'll talk to everybody soon awesome thanks folks